Hello from New York, and welcome to the uh, end of vascular uh, intervention uh, uh, webcast uh, uh, of uh, today from uh, Mount Sinai Medical Center Cardiovascular Catheterization Laboratories. Uh, before we uh, get started with today's case, uh, I'd like, uh, first of all, to uh, welcome you on my own behalf. This is George Dangas, and also on behalf of the entire faculty who you will meet uh, uh, shortly, the, shortly hereafter. Uh, let me just explain that in this website, uh, www.peripheralinterventions.org, uh, you will be able uh, to actually view this uh, uh, case after it's completed in the archived tab that you can see uh, um, in, the, in, the, in this uh, web page. And using the same tab, the archives, you can actually view previous uh, uh, such cases we have transmitted, including any blogs related to them regarding questions and answers from the um, internet users, um, actually questions from the internet users and answers from the faculty to those questions in relation to these cases. I'd like to remind everyone that aside from this webcast, we all will also hold a, a live symposium here at Mount Sinai uh, Hospital and Medical Center on October 12th on the top 10 advances on, in cardiology uh, this year. Uh, this will be again a, a, top, a, a top 10 uh, advances in cardiology symposium here at Mount Sinai at the medical center in the Stern Auditorium on October 12th. Uh, just for your calendars, the next webcast of this uh, uh, format, uh, we will be under the auspices of Mount Sinai and the American College of Cardiology on October 23rd, again Wednesday, the exact same time. And uh, without further delay, I'd like to uh, first of all invite you at any moment uh, to be sending any notes, comments, or questions through the portal of, the, uh, of this uh, web page that you are viewing the case, and we, I will be able to bring them up to the attention of the operators or address them uh, myself during the, uh, during the transmission. Let's go now to the cath lab. What we see are uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Krishnan, uh, Dr. Malik, Dr. Gujar, and co-workers. Uh, and they're gonna, they're gonna get, uh, explain to us a very interesting case that will involve uh, venous thrombosis. Uh, PK, welcome again. Welcome, George, thank you so much. Um, I'm getting a little echo in the room, guys. Uh, one of the questions, uh, I just wanna just kind of build on what George said, that we're, we're also gonna be on the CardioSource website in the, of, of the ACC, and uh, obviously you can also see the archive cases there as well as watch us live on the ACC website itself. Uh, you know, before we get started, I just wanna welcome uh, Dr. Rajesh Malik, our very, very close colleague here at Mount Sinai Medical Center, who's a assistant professor of surgery and works very closely with all of us here. Dr. Gujar, our interventional uh, endovascular fellow. We have uh, Dr. Rao, our our interventional fellow. We have uh, Ray Lascano, our nurse practitioner, uh, Elizabeth, our nurse, uh, Ricky, our, our lead tech, and, um, and the entire team. So I welcome all of you. We have a really, really interesting case to present. But before that, I just want to say one thing. You know, uh, we're obviously following the guidelines uh, presented to us by the American College of Cardiology to be fair and, uh, you know, open about, about what we're doing. And so we're not going to use any trade names uh, during the case. We will describe the products. And if, if, if anybody out there has any questions, they can just email me directly. Or, or the blog, as Dr. Danga said, and we will uh, answer them directly regarding what is the specific product that we've used. So I know that last time we presented the case, there was a lot of questions on we were describing and people were saying, what's the name? Well, that's the reason. So, you know, we really want to be uh, very fair and uh, very, really upfront with what we're doing. So I just want to uh, give you that disclosure. Um, you know, we have a wonderful case here of venous thrombosis, uh, which I think is a very common disorder. And I'm just going to have Dr. Guja present the case before we get started. Can you put this slide up? please. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. So we have a 50-year-old female patient uh, with complaints of right leg swelling, progressively worsening for three weeks. Um, so with the suspicion of possible DVT, we did a lower extremity venous Doppler, showed no evidence of DVT in the femoral popliteal systems bilaterally, but uh, there was a loss of respiratory variation in the waveforms in the proximal waves, proximal veins. And uh, this raised a suspicion of uh, possible proximal DVT, possibly a right uh, external iliac or a common iliac vein. Um, she has a past medical history of uh, mild intermittent asthma, hypertension. She's currently on Coumadin. Uh, she's a non-smoker uh, with no alcohol or IV drug use. Next slide, please. 
Uh, pertinent physical exams would be uh, pulses being present bilaterally, but she has a uh, two plus uh, right lower extremity non fitting edema with no tissue loss or erythema. Next slide. So, with the further suspicion, we ordered a CT venogram of the abdomen and pelvis uh, with the lower extremity runoff, which showed evidence of uh, right external iliac vein thrombosis. Uh, workup was uh, negative for various hypercoagulable state as of now. Uh, and the further workup is uh, still pending, but uh, most of the hypercoagulable states are negative. Uh, patient has, uh, was started on uh, anticoagulation for DVT, and a retrievable IVC filter was placed uh, prior to this procedure uh, a week ago. Uh, the plan is to do a catheter-directed thrombolysis of the proximal DVT with a possible stent placement. Uh, so and then uh, coming to our live case right now. So, so George, as you can see, like you know, we've done quite extensive workup. For the sake of time, I think the the important part of this uh, this entire case is is access of a popliteal vein, and we have Dr. Malik, who has always assisted us and have worked with us here for so many years to to show us. So I'm going to turn it over to Raj, and so uh, I just want everybody to focus on the ultrasound, which we'll see. And Raj, please go ahead. Okay, thanks, PK, for the introduction, and good morning, everybody. So, as uh, Karthik explained, uh, you know, this is a lady who has a uh, iliofemoral, at least a iliac vein DVT. Uh, the standard access for these cases is usually popliteal vein. Uh, so we have the patient prone on the bed and obviously the right side is away from me. Uh, that's important that you know you don't get mixed up and uh, obviously these cases have to be done under ultrasound guidance. There's really uh, in no way you're gonna puncture the popliteal vein without having an ultrasound available. Accessing the common femoral vein uh, is probably not the best idea because you may miss disease in the common femoral vein which you would like to get cleared up uh, if there is a thrombus that's sitting at that location. So as you can see, we have our ultrasound ready, the patient's prepped and draped. Uh, if you look right in the middle of my screen, I'm gonna squeeze down and you see the structure that's squeezing down right in the middle, that's gonna be your popliteal vein. And underneath it, it's a little bit harder to see, but probably somewhere around five o'clock or so is probably the artery. Now she's got a fair amount of edema in her legs, so the tissue plane is a little bit harder to see, but the most important part is to identify the vein. The vein is always more superficial. Uh, so once you identify the vein, and you squeeze it and you're happy, I'm just gonna move a little up and down and you can see that you know, she's got a fair amount of edema in her tissues and you can just, just by looking at it, you can kind of uh, appreciate how difficult this access may potentially be. And, and in the middle there, you can see I'm squeezing and that's a popliteal vein. The fact that I'm able to squeeze it should prove that we're probably not expecting any significant thrombus to be at that location. Now, now uh, since the patient is now, as Raj starts to get access, yep. the patient is in the prone position. So we've given her some sedation. Now I'm just gonna talk as he does it. So you, you wanna actually watch the needle enter into the vein. And uh, as you see, Dr. Malik, you can see there's depression of the tissue there, and he's entering very, very slowly. The INR is elevated in this patient, uh, which again, we, we did have her on Coumadin. Uh, so, so therefore, you know, we wanna try to make sure and ensure that we, that we don't have an arterial puncture. Lo siento, senora. So she's having a little bit of pain, so we might have to give a little bit of sedation and probably a little bit more of, uh, of numbing medicine, which I can give Dr. Malik if he would like. Let me go ahead and grab some uh, numbing medicine. And, um, yeah, let me, let me also explain that if uh, this is a, a, a particular type of procedure, if anyone has a, 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 a uh, access, right. wants Just to a send a... Uh, uh, um, yeah. a question uh, directly without using the website. They can just use uh, their handheld device or anything and send the question at info at peripheralinterventions.org. Info at peripheralinterventions.org is an email address that directly you can send a website. Obviously, you can use it. You can send questions from the uh, uh, from the top of the website that you are viewing as well uh, using that the cardio source uh, uh, window or the peripheralinterventions.org window, whichever website you are, because uh, this. Uh, this transmission is uh, is actually live from the CardioSource website. I think we'll take a microphone to take a picture, um, make yep, sure we're in the, the artery, uh, make sure in the vein. Setting up the patient appropriately for this type of procedure is very critical, not the patient to be comfortable. Right. And nurses is also very familiar, should be right. very familiar of how to mm -hmm. uh, handle and the care of a patient like that. Right, so George, I think I think the, the prep and the setup has been done well. She was uncomfortable. I want people to understand that there will be a little bit of discomfort while they do this. As much as you give, uh, you know, lidocaine, you're going 
you're not, you're not going to be able to get all the way down into the area where you want to go into. As, uh, as George was speaking, you, got, you, you guys saw that Dr. Malik got access um, into, the, into the vein, and now the plan is going to be to advance the wire under fluoro. So now I'm going to ask uh, Ricky to step aside a little bit. Uh, watch your knees, guys. Watch the ultrasound machine, guys. I think one important thing is, you know, yeah, we want to make sure that, you know, we are uh, in the vein. Obviously, we think it uh, looks pretty good. Uh, so for that reason, we're going to put a little micropuncture sheet in and take a picture. Depending on what uh, devices you're going to use, you may be putting an 8 or 9 French. Let me get some light again. Uh, you may be putting an 8 or 9 French sheet in there. So I think as a routine practice for me, after I put a micropuncture sheet, I always take a picture. Even though I may be 100% convinced, I'll always take a picture. Uh, I'd hate to put an 8-9 French sheet into the popliteal artery, especially with a patient whose INR is a little bit high. That, as you can imagine, would be a significant problem. I give very little lidocaine to begin with because it obscures uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the visualization, and this is, and this puncture is all about visualization. So, sorry. So once uh, you know, obviously, once uh, we have access, we okay. we give her some more lidocaine to make her more comfortable. Let's get an 11 blade. So, so now, now, now that we've actually gone ahead and done the, uh, the micropuncture access and now we're going to give 11 blade, uh, w once we take the picture, and I think, I think this is the important part uh, that, that, that we want to talk about, is actually what is the imaging that needs to be done. So I'm going to hand Dr. Malik the, uh, the, uh, the micropuncture, uh, 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 what's it called, sheath, and then he's going to put the, either the dilator or the sheath at discretion and then, the and then decide. I'm so, just going to hold the urgent. Okay. So the whole idea here, again, this is an extra step, which I think makes a lot of sense before you put a large French sheath. And now, Raj, I just want to talk to you about what, 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 what are the things that we want to talk about. One is, whenever we have cases like this, we know that iliofemoral DVT, what are the indications for catheter-directed thrombolysis, what are the, uh, the, uh, the, the thought process, the workup that goes into it. Just for everybody out there, one, one, one of the things that we do, we, we do here, this is contrast, one of the things that we do is, is, is make sure that, that we, we get a workup uh, with a CT venogram. Now, a, a CT venogram is, is let's, standard. Let's yep, oh, here you go. Oh, you want to do a subtraction? Yeah, just do a subtraction. Okay. Talk a little bit about that, PK. We have some questions regarding the pre-op preparation and how do you evaluate how much cloth there is and how reliable is a venogram and how repeatable it is and all that. Okay. So. Well, well. First of all, you can see here that that you, that you have a wonderful, uh, you know, vein with no yeah. no traumas involved. The first and foremost indication is that you have to have uh, ilio, iliofemoral DVT in order to do catheter-based thrombolysis. There is currently no indication for, for, can we have a super core wire? Uh, and, and SFA, uh, I mean, a, a great saphenous vein thrombosis or, or, uh, at, uh, or, or, or superficial femoral vein thrombosis at this state. So as far as workup is concerned, George, you know, the, the, the initial symptom is most, most of the time going to be, you know, um, indiscriminate edema, uh, one side versus the other. So in this young lady, she, she, has, she has edema that is really massive, um, the right side That's versus good. the left. Uh, she has been on uh, sub, uh, anticoagulation for quite some time, presented to us for actually venous insufficiency uh, workup. So when we saw that, we said to ourselves, well, this doesn't look like venous insufficiency. Let's make sure there's no proximal issues. So first thing we did is uh, we went ahead and got a Doppler a venous reflux study and a venous DVT for DVT. The, the lady had no, no issues as far as the deep venous thrombosis, then we said to ourselves, well, does she have a proximal issue going on? So what we referred her like was not one? for a CT venogram. We referred her, obviously, she's a woman of age where, where you could have, you know, a malignancies or anything like that compressing on the, on the iliac veins, causing, uh, you know, well, unilateral leg swelling. So, so we, went, we went ahead and, can we get some saline, guys? So we went ahead and got a pelvic venous ultrasound. A pelvic venous ultrasound done in our lab clearly showed showed that, that, that she had a, a, uh, a, a clot at the level of the iliac vein, because as, as Karthik described. And then, and then we went ahead for, for further workup of where the extension of the clot was, we went ahead and got a CT venogram with the idea that this lady has been adequately anticoagulated, um, has not been resolving her, her, her clot, and so therefore we wanted to go ahead and lyse her to prevent the complications of uh, uh, you know, post-thrombophlebatic syndrome. So, so you know, so I think-, you think, I think uh, So you think, PK, that the pelvic ultrasound would be a, Real? a, a routine no. in someone no. with a unilateral well. uh, leg swelling I, and a negative lower extremity DVT? 
I don't know if it's if it's if it's a routine, George. I mean, I want to let's see what Dr. Malik says. There's a filter up there. Yeah, just I, come I, down. I want to see what Dr. Malik says on that. I mean, as far as what I was thinking was, she has other other risk factors as well, mm-hmm. which uh, which you know which I was concerned about at this stage. You know, she has history of you know ovarian uh, issues in the past. Just to make sure that there's no nothing going on in the in the in the pelvis. Yeah, what, I what think a, uh, getting a routine pelvic ultrasound is is not probably uh, you know it depends on what what you're suspecting. I mean, right. It's, if it's on the, so this is a little, little interesting because her swelling is on the right side. You know, usually women uh, or men may suffer from May Turner syndrome where you have compression of the left iliac vein uh, uh, by the right common artery, and uh, and that may cause uh, left-sided swelling. Ready? The fact that she has right-sided swelling obviously yes. makes you makes you uh, think that there could be something compressing on the vein. Uh, you know, obviously the fact that she's a little bit, uh, you know. Uh, if, if, if this was some anatomic defect, she may have presented a little bit earlier. And we've had some 20-year-old patients who presented with Ready? extensive duo subtraction. Mm-hmm. I got a subtraction. Uh, you know, you'd, uh, you'd have Jack. a different suspicion. So a CT venogram would probably be my uh, standard uh, uh, test to do. I think it gives you a good idea of the extension of the thrombus, the location. Ibis. And also may give you an idea of uh, what anatomic defect, if this is a Mail compression from outside. Or uh, you know if this is May Turner, or if there are any masses that are that are or present. Grand slam. When he told me this was right-sided, I, I kind of you know I looked at the CT just to make sure that she didn't actually have a mass. But a pelvic ultrasound would probably not be a lower extremity venous duplex would be your starting test, and then if your suspicion is still high then you get a CT venogram to follow that. You know, George, I gotta tell you that the, the right-sided swelling is what kind of worried us, and she is of age where you can obviously have issues. So, you know, and this is an outpatient workup that we did, and uh, so therefore that's why we got it. I mean, I agree with uh, with uh, with Rods that if we were thinking about May Turner's, we would, so uh, we would probably go right up. Ten, you want Pernivus? Yeah, we're so doing is this, uh, does we see now, uh, uh, Angel, a venogram with a clot, is yeah. this the, the only area there's a clot, or that's is there a, a clot y- even for the proximal? Yeah, that's the only area at least based on the CT, now we can take a little picture up higher, uh, but on the CT, that's where the thrombus was. It's kind of surprising. She's pretty symptomatic from that. Well, it's quite. Uh, it's definitely quite large. Here. Yeah, it's, it's almost obscuring the entire iliac vein, uh, and there was no comp- there was no mass or compression effect uh, that was seen. So it was just a piece of thrombus. And you know that it'll be interesting to see what whether there was a web underneath there. You know why she why she developed this. Okay, good. Uh, so that would be an interesting thing. So to George, look at. I'm going to do an ultrasound here. Uh, what size sheet does this go through? Does this go yeah, through a five, that. guys? It goes through a six. Oh, All right, so let's then, upsize to an eight. Then, then we're going to upsize to an eight French sheet. Then we'll reintroduce the wire. So let's just get a stiff. So, so why we're doing the wire? why we're doing the imaging? Uh, why don't we just do supercore, bro? That's fine. So give me a supercore. So wh- while we're doing the imaging is is for two reasons. <laughs> you know, I w- I personally like to do IVUS imaging at this particular uh, to really understand uh, what what exactly is happening at this level. Obviously, we have a CAT scan. We know we we are not certain whether whether there's a web. We could not tell whether there was a web at this stage. So I think an IVUS is definitely going to help us a little bit to uh, to give us an idea. And second is also to size uh, the iliac vein um, if if we need to go ahead and do any sort of uh, you know stent balloon angioplasty which we may or may not need to do so I mean I think at this stage George I mean right. if, if you look at if you look at what we're dealing with you're, you're dealing with a, a focal uh, obstructive uh, thrombus um, uh, at the level of the external iliac vein okay which is causing significant symptoms of, of leg edema in the right lower extremity so she is she's been on anticoagulation for quite some time for four weeks has absolutely no resolution of this and and you know she's very symptomatic so now is when the choice was made to go with uh, with catheter based thrombothrombolysis um, so catheter based thrombolysis I'm just going to talk a little bit about that one is the role of placing an IVC filter prior to and you I think I want to I want to comment on that and I want to have Dr. Malik comment on that That's as well Let, let's get the uh, the ivis let's get the mailman so dr malik what's your what's your idea on on uh, on um, catheter based thr- i mean uh, on uh, prophylactic placement of an ivc filter yes yeah, so if you actually look at data you know data does not support uh, placing an ivc filter but in my own mm-hmm. practice uh mm-hmm. if there's an extensive clot i mm-hmm. almost back. always place a filter but you know if you look at the papers you would see that uh, push, push. it doesn't really show any difference in pulmonary embolism but you know i would hate to have ha- be that one person that gets a pulmonary percent. embolism because i'm doing some extensive uh, 
uh, you know, extensive clot, extensive thrombolysis that, that we're dealing with. So I routinely place a retrievable IVC filter. In fact, what sometimes we do is, you know, we'll do a jugular puncture, place a filter, leave the sheath in place, take care of the clot, do our thrombolysis, whatever needs to be done if there's an overnight setting. Real. And then once we're finished with the, with the lysis and we're happy with the result, we'll take out the filter. Uh, and since we have jugular access, we'll take out the filter at that same, at that same setting. So that definitely can That's be done. Be um, but then again, if there's an extensive clot, uh, you know, you can consider it, but again, data does not support it right now. So at this stage, you know, uh, the other reason why I did it was obviously because, I mean, we were planning on doing this as a live case. So, so what we wanted to do was make sure that we, we had a filter in place. She was going to be obviously discharged and come back to us on this date. Uh, the Ivis is already up. So, uh, so that's the reason. So it's, it's controversial for the audience. Uh, you know, the data doesn't necessarily support it, but it's probably not unreasonable to think about placing a retrievable filter uh, for the time being. So we've introduced the 018 uh, intravascular ultrasound here, and now we're going to do a manual pullback. Um, and um, I don't know if Dr. Malik wants to help us do the pullback, and we can just talk about the, uh, the IVIS. George, you want to describe the IVIS as he pulls it back? Well, yes, the catheter is all the way uh, there's an eccentric, uh, 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 not an eccentric actually, the, the ivus is at the one edge of the vessel. The vessel is very big, yep. it's a vein, we don't really see um, uh, where it ends, but it looks like it's not going there. from the right center there. all the way to 2 o'clock mm -hmm. and all the way to like 10 o'clock and uh, stop here all the way through the screen. Right. Now, George, you can see here, we're going to stop. We're right at the level of the thrombus. Right. Yeah, we need to, a little help here that we can see that the thrombus became a little bit uh, uh, more like uh, 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 echogenic and close to the catheter. The lumen is very small between uh, uh, eight or nine o'clock. You see the lumen now, the magnification helps us a lot. You see the lumen as a small crescent. Yeah, and what's on top is really no the clot. Back. And now it, the clot uh, is disappeared. We right. went uh, further back. Yep, and so we're now- You see there's a bit of a mural uh, crescent yep. we saw, and now we see nothing. The vessel size right here is one, two, three, four. It's about five O. Go up top. Uh, so I'm going to go up top, George, since we and dropped which it. Which is uh, 10 millimeters. Uh, and over uh, here. This is uh, 2 millimeter per dot. Now, here is going to be even harder to me measure the vessel size. I mean, as far as I can see. One, two, it's at three, least four, 10. Five, it's at least 10. Yeah. So, so you know, so I think, I think the question becomes is, if you can play the IVIS back to all of us, is, I mean, I personally am looking for some sort of web within the vessel, which we may see after we do our, 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 our catheter-based thrombolytic better than we've seen now. So, Raj, any comments on what you're looking for in the IVIS? Uh, you know, that I, I agree. I think getting an idea of uh, the size of the vessel, especially if you're doing a lot of deep venous work for venous in insufficiency, this is paramount that you get comfortable using this kind of technology uh, to see if patients really have made thinners or not. And also, sizing is a, is a big thing because, you know, we tend to always undersize the vein, but uh, you need, need to be aggressive in sizing the vein. So uh, this helps you in, in making those kind of decisions. So now we got the information on the IVIS, and now, now we're going to go ahead. Back, actually, because we'll need a stiffer yep. wire to go up there. Mm -hmm. You need so. a stiffer wire than this? I mean, no, not than this, yeah, for the, for the trellis. Well, okay. So, uh, so uh, now that we're, what we're going to do is we're going to switch out, get a super core wire again, guys. What we're going to do is we're going to switch out, put a stiffer wire up, and, and what we will do is at this stage go ahead and initiate our catheter-based thrombolysis. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about the different types of thrombolysis that you can do. And obviously, one is you, you, you can do uh, what, rheolytic thrombectomy with, with, the, with, the, with the device that's been FDA approved for both the coronary and the, and the peripheral circulation. This mag down, um, which, mag down guys? Uh, the, the, the second thing you can do, I, I, another type of thrombolysis, which is actually using a device that acts as, uh, for lack of a better word, an egg beater with a proximal occlusion balloon. And you want to go up further? Yes. Yeah, and and a, distal, an a distal occlusion balloon. And so, therefore, you can actually go ahead and, um, and you know, allow the, uh, the, um, the clot to be macerated and then, and then go ahead and, um, and then suck out the clot. So let's get that, the device that's, right. and, and that's what we've decided to use. And again, like I told the audience, if you guys want to 
don't know what that device is, please don't hesitate to email myself or Dr. Dangus or, or go ahead and call in now. So, so the, obviously the, the advantages of catheter-based thrombolysis are very, very simple. One, that you have 10. a higher concentration of, of the thrombolytic agent within, within the clot. So in this particular level, it's not a massive load of, uh, of thrombus that Raj and I are facing here, George. But however, we, we do, we, you, know, you don't have to have the worry of a systemic, massive effect of systemic thrombolysis. So at this stage, what, what we're going to do is uh, the balloon occlusion catheters, you'll have one proximal at the, at the common iliac vein and one distal at the common femoral vein introduced via the, uh, the popliteal vein. And then we, once we inflate this, uh, Dr. Malik will go ahead and describe uh, you know, what he's doing as, as we're setting up the device. The reason we did not open the device is that there are two size devices available. Do you want to talk a little bit yeah, about the there, size? Yeah, you know, there are, there are uh, multiple different sizes as far as the infusion length goes, depending on what kind of uh, area you're treating. Uh, obviously, this is quite focal. Uh, we would have liked a short device, but I think our uh, our choice is a little bit, unfortunately, is, is a little bit on the long side. So we'll have to we'll have to deal with that. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, they do come in different infusion lengths. So they come in about 10, 20, 30. Um, you know, a 10 centimeter infusion length would have been would have been would have been okay uh, to use it. We want it to be very localized. Uh, we're going to end up using a little bit longer device. So. You know, sorry for that. You'll 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 see the balloons. It's going to be rather far apart. Uh, the goal is to try and get well, all the TPA within one uh, location and, and and get it treated nicely. So now, as far as the prep of this device, Raj, uh, I mean, obviously this is going to require multiple different flushes. Yeah. So okay. what we're going to do is we're going to take the device out. You're going to have three ports yep. that that he's going he's going to he's going to show you. So you have two green ports, which are for the two balloons that uh, basically isolate. And let me just inflate them here and show it to you. Let me yep. get some half-strength saline. Can we focus saline. on that, please? Saline? Oh, you want contrast? Contrast. Right here, half-strength. Half-strength, good. Mm -hmm. And let's get half-strength. I don't want to put any air in there nope, right now. No so problem. We'll just get this. And as you can see, as we <coughs> inflate the balloon, you can see, so this is the distal balloon. This is the balloon that's going to be away from us. I'm not going to inflate it too much. I'm just going to give you a rough idea. So that's the distal balloon. We're going to be inflating that once we get into the more proximal common iliac vein. And here's the proximal balloon. And you can see that this is, uh, this is you know, I'm, I'm not inflating them to uh, appropriate size, but uh, we'll do that under fluoroscopic guidance. I don't want to spoil the balloons right now. And uh, this is the area between the two balloons where the thrombolytic is going to be concentrated. And we'll also have a wire that goes through it and creates a sinusoidal waveform. So it's almost with two fixed uh, balloons. And then, you know, this is going to be spinning. Just speak if you hold the two yep. balloons. Mm -hmm. You know, this is just going to be spinning around with the two balloons kind of stabilizing it at end. So it's almost like an egg beater. You know, it's almost going to be like a sinusoidal waveform kind of beating up at this, uh, at this clot. And then the TPA kind of getting in there and uh, trying to dissolve some of it. And at the end of that, we're actually gonna aspirate back and we have an aspiration uh, port right over here, the white port, and we're gonna aspirate back whatever clot we can get. And that's how we also prevent a lot of the thrombolytics from going systemic. So this is a, this is a good device for, you know, in my practice, uh, I use this, uh, especially when you have patients who are very close post-op and you can't do, you know, long-term or you can't do rheolytic uh, thrombolytics. This is, this is good because the, Systemic absorption is is, is quite less, um, and uh, so that way it turns out to be a nice uh, nice thing. Let me just get this. Yeah, we're just trying here. to now get rid of all the uh, the dye that we put in for demonstration purposes. And I apologize, we didn't have the the smaller size available. So we are obviously we at a, being an institution that we should be having it, but unfortunately we don't. But again, I I think you know ideally speaking this does work. It's just going to be a little bit more awkward in terms of the length of the area that yeah. you're going to treat. So, so we're going to go ahead now. Rod, can you comment a little bit on um, on um, on um, on a realytic thrombectomy with the um, pass, uh, with uh, with the device, as, as well as can you also comment comment on the Ecos uh, device as well? You know, we don't. Uh, you know, we don't have. Unfortunately, we don't have the Ecos device here. But from uh, from what the I ultrasound uh, device, oh, the ultrasound sorry. device. Sorry, my fault. Uh, you know the. But uh, from uh, from colleagues that I know, they're uh, very impressed with the ultrasound guided. Uh, you know, thrombolytic infusion catheters. They've really shortened their infusion time. Uh, so I think it's definitely worth uh, looking at. There are a fair number of people that are, uh, that are using it. So if you have access to it and you're planning to leave a lytic catheter in overnight because there's extensive clot, then that would be a, uh, that would be a good option to, uh, uh, to use. Now, I also want to talk a little bit about angiographic technique here. You can see we have the glow tape 
available, and you can see the market. There's the proximal balloon going up. So let's mag down because I think the I'm going to mag down. Distal balloon is going to be really, really low yeah. here, which is going to be almost in the uh, the common femoral vein. There it is. So let's go up so, a little bit more. So we're going to go up a little, little bit higher, right at this level. Is she okay, oh. guys? I'm going to the cave a little bit. Okay, a little bit into the cave, right there. Okay. Okay. Is she okay, guys? We're in the leg. That's okay. That's that's expected. Yeah, we're we're you know we're manipulating an eight French sheet uh, around her uh, popteal fossa, so yes, you can definitely have a little bit of pain from that. So we're gonna go ahead and inflate the balloons here. So let's do one at a time since we can't mm -hmm. really see them that well. So I'll do the distal, I think, Prakash. Okay. Uh -huh. Can we give her a little bit of? Uh, yep. Go ahead and do, go ahead and do yours then. Up top? You know, yours is the bottom one, it looks okay, like. Okay, I'm going to do this one first. Mm -hmm. There you go. So you just want to inflate until the contrast hits both those That's black it. dots, and that should I be like plenty. I like it right there. You know, this is not a big okay. vein. We've got to remember that we're, we're in the in the femoral vein over there. And this is probably going to be a little bit bigger, so I'm just going to go ahead and inflate that. So as you can see, you know, we still we want to make it almost like a little uh, rectangle kind of going across the, the two black dots that are there. Two black marks and almost there, and I kind of feel pretty good about that. Looks close enough to me. Mm -hmm. All right, we're gonna pull out the wire. Here's so the. This, yeah, is, the, uh, this is the egg beater device that that we were talking about, for lack of a better word. Um, this I'm gonna pull this out, and Dr. Malik is gonna show you how it works. This is the this is the uh, the, the wire which is going to work, and yeah, this is a so control panel. This is a control panel. Sometimes it's a little tricky uh, getting it in because it doesn't have a lot of pushability, so you have to be a little bit patient. But as you can see, That's if I turn it on, you know, unfortunately, I can't. I think I'll have to support it to turn it on. So this is the, this is the wire which creates a sinusoidal waveform basically inside, the, um, inside this catheter here. So we'll go ahead and, and load this up. I think if I put it... If I try to demonstrate it out here, it may actually end up damaging this uh, yeah, device. So we're not so going to spin it for you guys until we I get I tried to spin it, but... <laughs> oh, you did already. Oh, yeah, sorry. I tried to, but that's, I'm just going to unwind it here, basically. Yep. So there this, we go. this okay. goes through the central lumen of the balloon. So yeah. right now, technically speaking, uh, uh, to the audience and Dr. Dangus, we're occlusive uh, approximately at the what common, co common villia, iliac vein. What's the maximum diameter this balloon can go? Uh, I'll have to look at the IFU. I think it's. Uh, it, let me ask the. So I'm gonna have team. to look at the thing. The maximum di diameter of the proximal balloon, guys. Yeah, seems like uh, it could go up to like 15 or 20. 15. 12. Uh, 12. It's actually 12. 12. So yes. you know, we saw that the that the vein is about 10. Right. So you consider some distensibility of the vein. I, I yeah, think you 12 know, could. Uh, could uh, nicely occlude, and I think yeah, the pattern of the balloon that you see, it's been, uh, it is a. It is round at the top of the bottom, but straight on the two sides. This probably means that on the two sides, it is opposed to the wall. I think, yes, absolutely. I, I think a technical issue here, George, is that uh, when you see uh, uh, Dr. Malik or Raj pull, pushing the, uh, the, uh, the, the device in, you cannot bend it at the level. And believe me, as good as he is in doing this, and all of us have done this, it's very difficult not to bend it. And that's why he's being very, very careful in the pressure that he's doing as, um, and, and, and sending this up. Because a lot of times you can tend to kink it, uh, especially when you get right near the end. If you can watch his fingers, you can see that the amount of room that he has between that, that and this. Now he locks the device into place, and now you're safe. So now you've got, you've got, you've got proximal occlusion with that 12 millimeter balloon. Put on this one. Okay, and, and, now, and now you've got the TPA loaded. Now, Dr. Malik, can you comment on the dose of TPA, the type of TPA, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, so I mean, most of us would probably use somewhere between uh, 7 to 10 milligrams of TPA per session. So let's say we wanted to run this uh, device twice. Uh, you know, if there's an extensive clot, I may use up to a maximum of about 15 milligrams of TPA, and I may divide it up as 7, uh, mil uh, seven milligrams for the first segment that I do, and then if I have to do something more, you know, I may use another 7 milligrams. Obviously, going about 15 or 20 milligrams gets a little bit uh, uh, riskier, so I, I probably wouldn't go uh, higher than that. Uh, and like I said, I mean, there's not much systemic uh, absorption, but I think uh, at that point, you know, 7 to 15 is probably the maximum. I think here, if we use about 7, this is a very focal uh, clot. Unfortunately, we're using a, a long catheter, so, you know, we may have to use close to the 7 or 10 milligram uh, dose and then, and then see how it uh, works. So the way you work this device is I usually go ahead and, and start the device and let it start beating. Uh, uh, and as you c if you start looking at the um, ultrasound, you may as you start looking at fluoroscopy, you, you probably can start seeing that the catheter is starting to spin. And if you can see it on the thing over there, you can see. Here. Now I'm just going to mag up for you guys at home to see a little bit better. Put it on corner, please. So I'm just going to go ahead and show you what it's doing. 
So you get so I'll res so what I like to do is I, I, I like to start uh, getting the clot a little bit broken up first before I give the TPA. So once the clot starts to macerate just a tiny bit and I find that the, that the TPA works uh, a, a little bit better, I, I usually give about a milligram every two to three minutes. So if you're if you're using about 10 milligrams, you're talking about a 20 or 30 minute uh, run that this may uh, that this may anticipate. So can you could could you reduce the magnification so we can see the top of the bottom balloon at the same time so we get an idea of how long this is and well, all that. Well, obviously, it's, it's quite this long. This is too long, This yeah. is too long, George, as okay, you can see. Okay, that's pretty good. No, no, we you got know. it. That's what we uh, wanted yeah, to we, show. Yeah, we definitely wanted a, a smaller, uh, localized one. So I've given a, a couple milligrams of TPA. Well, let's start a timer. So what we'll do is every two minutes, we'll give a milligram of TPA. Now I can change the wavelength of this uh, sinusoidal waveform. So if you're on fluoroscopy, as you can see, I'm going to shift it up. And yeah. as you can see, it's the 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 focus of the center has kind of shifted, so mm. I, you can essentially keep going back and forth to change the wavelength. Obviously, it's a, it's a long balloon, so it's a, it's a little bit harder uh, for this to spin, uh, but uh, every two to three minutes, we'll keep changing the direction, so we get a nice kind of equal beating of that, uh, of that thrombus. So uh, if, and I, if I remember correctly, the exact location of the thrombus was around five, five CM. Probably, yep, yeah, exactly. uh, it's about five. So we're about uh, 20 on top, and maybe 30 from the below the clot. Because yep. this particular clot is unusual in that it's rather focal. It's very, Most clots it's very are unusual. This, yeah, this is an unusual is, clot. This is very so unusual. So I wonder whether she's got a web underneath there or what exactly happened. It definitely is. And it's on the right side. And, so and you know what? I got to tell you, this is the kind of patient that you want to be careful that you don't have an external compressive tumor or something on the vein. I mean, you, you've, got to, you've got to expand your horizons beyond just, you know, May Turner's and think about other things. First of all, it's the wrong leg. And second of all, why, you know, we've done a lot of these where it's more extensive throughout the iliac vein, now you have a little focused plot, and that's where the CT and the ultrasound help us to define the pelvic anatomy a lot better for us to be able to make a judgment call. Now that we got a little time, because this is the part where you know everybody needs to take a break, have a coffee, and talk, mm -hmm. but the, the, the point is now I can ask Raj about the choice of lytic agents. I mean, is there anything different? What's, what's your feeling on, on what, are, what are the lytic agents you, you like to use here? I think most of us here use TPA. I don't think we use... I know uh, it's been, RPA has been studied, I yeah. mean, uh, and uh, you know, so that, that's the whole point on in terms of does it matter is there an issue uh, I, I mean what, do you, what is your experience I think whatever is uh, available I think in my practices wherever I've you know wherever I've practiced everything we've, we've essentially used TPA at, at all places so and it, it works really well so we're very comfortable using it so I would I would stick to whatever you're comfortable using the other question is if you were doing rheolytic thromba uh, th thromba thromba uh, thrombectomy here yeah uh, but what's your technique of that say you don't have this egg beater device yeah. Yeah. or you don't have the ultrasound yeah. device now you you have a real Thrombolic, uh, thrombectomy device because you're a cardiac cath lab. Yep. How would you, what is your approach on that? Do you, do you dwell, the, dwell a catheter first and then go ahead and suck yeah, it out? What, what is your approach? Yeah, what I do, uh, if, if that was the case, then, you know, actually we just did a case over the weekend and uh, essentially what we do is we would power pulse spray it. So you shoot the TPA into uh, the thrombus, let it kind of sit there for a good 10, 15 minutes, let it start working. And then you can use the, the thrombectomy mode to try and remove the clot. And obviously, if at the end of your runs you're still unsatisfied or there's a significant amount of, thr of thrombus burn, you may have to leave a lytic catheter at that, uh, at that time. For so, so would it be fair to say that the amount of thrombus burden um, uh, will, will, will uh, influence your judgment on the device that you use or no? It may not. In, uh, it probably won't uh, affect the device I use. It may affect whether I'm going to leave an infusion catheter or the amount of TPA uh, that I use. I mean, this is my this has been my go-to device for a fairly uh, long time. I find that you don't get a lot of systemic absorption of TPA, and I like that aspect of this uh, of this device. And if I wanted to leave a lytic catheter, I could. And I really haven't given the patient that much systemic TPA right now, so I feel I feel comfortable. So I find this idea and this technique a little bit more intriguing and I'm more comfortable using this uh, but you know we do use both uh, or different devices that are uh, that are available so so I think now now you know now that we talked a little bit about this and we were about three minutes and 30 seconds into it we're anticipating at least a 20 minute run before we make some decisions uh, the, the, the the question here becomes is now once this is done right let's talk about stepwise fashion we talked about the IVC filter being controversial but we decided to do it you do it the second thing becomes is once this is done what are the, the things that you're looking for? What are the parameters that tell you that, that I am done here, I need to balloon, I need to stand? What are the things you're looking for? So I think that you know once, once we get this done, we'll take a venogram and see if there was any change uh, in that uh, 
in that thrombus. Obviously, it may have been present for a long time, so we don't know how well the lytic therapy is going to actually work. Uh, depending on what it looks like at the end, I would say if there's, if there's more than 50% stenosis, then and we've given lytics and there's been no change whatsoever, then you know probably leaving a catheter long term will probably not be beneficial. This may be there longer than uh, uh, than three we weeks. know. You know who? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, t at two to three weeks or uh, or two to four weeks, you still should get a decent result. But this is not the straightforward uh, kind of thrombus that you see, and she's quite symptomatic from it. So if there's a 50% residual stenosis still remaining and there's no effect, I'd probably go ahead and balloon and stent this area to keep it uh, keep it open. Now, when we're we're talking about balloon and stenting, and I'm, I also obviously want George's opinion on this. I mean, as far as size the balloon you know you know as, as cardiac interventionalists I mean all of us have our algorithm how we size balloons obviously with the venous disease uh, we know you have more resistant uh, your lesions you have webs as we spoke about I mean how do you size the balloon do you use IVIS guidance to size the balloon do you use IVIS guidance to size the stent or is there some other algorithm you follow you know most of us will use uh, IVIS to get an idea but we're we're relatively aggressive about ballooning and stenting we'd like to put the even though the iliac vein may measure eight ten millimeters you know we'd want to put a 14, 16, 18 stent because the veins do tolerate it relatively well. They, they tolerate ballooning very well. There's very low chance that you would actually, you know, end up uh, rupturing uh, uh, a vein. So using a, uh, you know, high pressure balloon would probably be okay. And then trying to leave uh, a large stent. I mean, most people, irrespective of the size of the vein, will, you know, at least leave a 14 or 16 14 millimeter uh, stent. So we're going to try and leave the, uh, you know, a relatively large size. Probably if you have a 16 millimeter stent, try and leave something like that to keep this open and, and, and keep it pain. Well, you know, in our practice, uh, uh, you know, we use generally 18, 18 by 80s, uh, 20 by 80s. And, you know, so that, that brings me to the next question is uh, w when you go ahead and stent this, I mean, we know about watermelon seeding occurring with these stents, right? So the question is, what is, obviously without using the brand, what is the stent size? Would it be a bare metal nitinol stent? Would it be a, a, a different uh, type of stent that you would use in terms of this? And second, how important is flexibility of the stent in this particular region, uh, being that it's in the pelvis? And, and what is your opinion about well, watermelon seeding of the stent while you go ahead and deploy it? Yeah, you definitely can have some watermelon seeding, but I mean, we most of us will use uh, self-expanding stents. I mean, I don't really think there's an indication for a balloon expandable stent right. in the vein. I think that uh, the vein does accommodate very nicely and uh, and a self-expanding stent will generate enough force. Uh, we would obviously prefer to use uh a stent that has a little bit more radial force, uh, like a wall stent. Like a wall stent would be would be would be better uh, to kind of get that area nicely opened up. Y it's important to oversize because you know we've had instances where these stents have embolized. Uh, you know people have uh, uh, used a smaller size or they've used a true to size. Uh, so if we put an eight or ten millimeter stent in this in this iliac, I can tell you we'll probably have complications later on. Uh, so we want to put a large enough uh, stent that it doesn't. Uh, doesn't move and doesn't embolize. Obviously, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, watermelon seeding, I mean, that can definitely happen because because in our experience with the in these kind of lesions, you yes, worry exactly. about watermelon it seeding. It definitely can happen, so you have to be careful, especially deploying the wall stent where it's, it's it becomes a little bit trickier because it's not you know it's not the most accurate. It it, it it may jump, so probably using a little bit longer stent than you have to. You know, making sure that you're you have the lesion in the in the center. So even if you move a little bit. A couple, couple of millimeters here and there may not make, make that much of a difference, but you definitely have to be careful to do that. So, so, so I think to summarize, I think, I think you know, the appropriate balloon sizing is important. Be aggressive with your balloon dilatation. Use uh, non-compliant or relatively non-compliant balloons. I know in the endovascular space, we don't have a lot of mm -hmm. large non-compliant balloons. And, and, and number three is, as far as the standing is concerned, I think one of the mistakes that I, I, I will be, uh, you know, specific to interventional cardiologists is that we, tend, we might tend to undersize the venous stent because we're not as familiar working with with the venous space as the surgeons are and the radiologists are. So I think it's extremely important to collaborate as we've done here, and more importantly, to really to, to, to follow the principles that Dr. Malik and Raja clearly outlined. You know, using a larger stent, um, uh, oversizing your stent, allowing yourself um, enough room so that if, if this vein does expand post, uh, you know, resolution of the clot, that the stent is large enough to accommodate, and also uh, having the confidence that your vein is gonna be able to accommodate a large enough stent. Also, understand the limitations of your equipment. So you know that most of the self-expanding nitinol stents that we use for arterial
material work, the largest one that I'm aware of goes about to about 14 millimeters. So, you know, a tendency may be, oh, I've got a 14 millimeter stent that I've used in my iliac, so let me go ahead and put it in the, in the, in the iliac vein. Well, that may not necessarily be the case. So obviously, you know, explore the different equipments that are available. We're going to demonstrate a, a stent called the wall stent for lack of a, lack of a, a better differentiation between the two stents. And we're going to go ahead and, uh, and probably use that if that's necessary here. The length of the stent we'll discuss, but again, again, now you've seen the, the lytics are working. We're now at about 10 minutes, and Dr. Malik is going back and forth with the speed. Uh, can you describe what yeah. you're doing, Raj? Well, what I'm doing, I'm actually leaving this, this knob here controls the speed of the wave, and I've kind of kept that at uh, maximum. What I'm doing is that every two minutes or so, I'm injecting a milligram of TPA, and I'm just turning this knob, and I can kind of, you know, there you go. I kind of just change the direction uh, or the primary kind of you know, waveform wave uh, to keep changing it so we get a uniform uh, beating of the entire area. Obviously, if this was an extensive DVT, this would be more important to get the entire area nice and, uh, uh, you know, macerated. But uh, here it's a pretty focal area. But uh, every two minutes or so, I'm kind of changing the length. And you can see I'm going to change it down this way because this is where we were. So every two minutes, I'm giving a milligram of TPA and then changing the direction uh, of the... Roger, how important is it to change that direction? Is that just an experience thing that you've done over the years, or is it something that you feel really has an effect on the on the trauma? Yeah, I think it actually does have an uh, f effect. I think if you're just sitting in one place, you know, you may not be macerating a thrombus that's sitting, because it is a sinusoidal waveform kind of uh, situation, so it may be missing a portion. So once you keep changing the wavelength back and forth, you're actually getting a uniform um, you know, beating of the thrombus, if I can use that word. So right. Well, well, it's a lack of a better, better yeah. way to describe it. The question I also have is now, we know that a lot of people are now talking about this post-thrombophlebitic syndrome, right? So I know there's a temptation for people to do this kind of thing on a, on a, a deep vein, you know, uh, you know uh, it, below the common femoral. We know that, so the indications are very clear with this. We yes. want to be above the common femoral vein, right? And, uh, and or the iliac vein. Yes, it has to be a proximal symptomatic DVT in a patient who is relatively active of, of good lifespan. So, you know, you don't want to be doing this on an 80, 90 year old patient because they're probably not going to develop uh, post-thrombotic syndrome. And there is a little bit of risk of TPA or, or procedure. I mean, it's not much of a complication from this thing, but you know, you could have an arterial puncture, things like that could, uh, could happen. So it has to be a symptomatic proximal. My thing is iliac, common femoral, is acceptable, anything distal to the common femoral is not. Similarly, if you're doing it in the upper extremity, axillary, subclavian uh, would be acceptable, uh, or going into the SVC is, is an acceptable uh, area to do this. Interestingly, the chest guidelines that were just yes. published recently uh, don't support this, which is surprising. Uh, they, uh, the previous edition did uh, uh, support it, but now there are more people who, you know, I think there are better studies coming out that actually show that this does uh, make a difference. So I'm hoping in their next uh, okay. next iteration they they do uh, they do change that to uh, support this uh, technology. I've probably done, you know, over a hundred cases, uh, probably 100 to 200 cases of of proximal DVTs, and I can tell you the patients greatly benefit. And, uh, you know, as you follow them out, they have absolutely no leg swelling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that will obviously reduce the risk of post-thrombotic syndrome also. And we've done nowhere near those, those number of cases here, but clearly the ones we've done have benefited. The, the other question I also want to uh, just, to, again, I want to hit, hit home with the audience and the people watching is that it, the important points that Dr. Malik made there are, are very, very clear. I said, you know, this procedure is, it should be done in the appropriate patient because it does have its antecedent complications. Okay. Obviously, it's starting with the access point where you saw the, uh, the, 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 uh, the vein lying right on top of the artery. So obviously if you're giving lytics and if you have an arterial puncture, you may get into issues. Number two, there is a sl small but, uh, but uh, uh, a, a risk of uh, systemic uh, you know, uh, complications of lytic therapy, even though you're trying to maintain it in, in that column of uh, the uh, common iliac vein up to the common femoral vein, or in this case, into the, into the, uh, the deep vein. So clearly you, you, you're, you're, you're really going to have that issue of uh, you know a small uh, uh, amount of complication that could occur so you need to really watch your guidelines and make sure that 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 you you pick the appropriate patient the question uh, dr. Malik once you're done with this and you've now lie say you've stented it you know we talked about standing what is the post management of the leg what are the things that you have to do for the leg do you wrap the leg do you wear compression stockings how long do they wear compression stockings and what's the follow-up of the of the of the pelvic vein intervention that you've done so if you have a DVT, then you need to be treated with anticoagulation as uh, 
what may seem appropriate. So depending on what the cause is, anywhere from three to six months. And I usually put them on a antiplatelet agent. I don't use dual antiplatelet, but I will put them on put them on aspirin. As far as compressions go, I usually recommend at least two years after an, ex an extensive DVT to wear uh, compression stockings because if you tell the patients two years, they'll be lucky if they wear it half the time. <laughs> so I, I actually over try to overestimate, but I think two years is a, is a reasonable time frame to try and prevent the post-thrombotic complications that may happen. In fact, right after this procedure, we're going to wrap her leg up in an, in, an, in an ACE bandage just to give us some hemostasis and also to help the edema come down, especially if we are successful in opening this lesion, to try and get all the fluid back into the, into the venous system and, and hopefully keep it that way. And then, and then she'll, be, she'll need to be compliant with her compression stockings. And I have a feeling, you know, we've seen patients 24, 48 hours who have significant reduction in their in their swelling. So even if you don't get a 100% result, even reducing some of the thrombus burden definitely makes a difference uh, in these patients. We've done cases where we've had maybe 20 or 30% reduction in thrombus burden. You know, the patients are not candidates for long-term lysis. Let's say they're recent post-op. We would stop at that point and put them in a compression. And you'd notice actually, surprisingly, within a day or so that they would have a significant amount of relief. It's okay. I mean, I know that we're going to go a little bit over time here because of the of the uh, of the uh, the length of the case, and I'm I'm just checking with my AV team if that's okay. We can go a little bit over. the The reason is, I mean, I think these are the kind of cases that where we have to really cover all the bullet points. And you know, yes, it is a time consuming case, and I think it's important to see what the resolution of this is going to be, and also what, how we're going to manage it. So again, I want the audience to bear with us, and obviously, it'll be archived if you have to step away. But 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 what Dr. Malik pointed out is that with the, with the uh, post uh, management with the with the stockings and one of the things that we commonly see is that patients will come back um, from other other areas or wherever it may be and not have worn the stockings and and and, and don't see the significant uh, you know reductions uh, of, of leg edema that we we're seeing here and I think it's important to have frequent follow-ups of follow-ups of these patients yeah I think that's the one most important thing you can do is to stress the importance of compression I mean, that makes a, a big difference to their long-term uh, morbidity from this kind of a problem. Now, 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 if you have proximal in the in inferior vena cava, and I, you know, I want to cover all different ways. You know, we haven't gotten to May Turner's yet, which I'll get to next. So, so now if you're talking, this is the right side, it's not May Turner's, it's a thrombotic syndrome. If you have inferior vena, vena cava thrombosis, is the management any different uh, than, than it is now? Do you get bilateral access? What are the things that you do differently? You know, if, the, if it is extending down in, into the iliac veins bilaterally, and usually it is, if you have it into the you know, inferior vena cava, you can expect that you may have some thrombus on both sides. So yes, I usually do get bilateral access at that point. Uh, the remaining parts of the step, sometimes, you know, I've also used uh, bilateral devices simultaneously, have them, uh, have them go up each iliac system into the cava and have them run simultaneously because, uh, you know, to try and get good resolution of the clot. And the remaining portion would be the same with your IVIS and you try and see if it's in the inferior vena cava, it's probably some sort of web, web. That's, uh, that's present. So you definitely want to open that up. And, you know, we've done cases where we've placed uh, inferior vena cava stents, you know, very large stents in, into the inferior vena cava to try and uh, keep those open also. And what, what, what do you expect as a patency of those stents, Dr. Malik? I mean, in terms of, uh, okay, the question is, what's the patency? And the second one is, if, if the patent uh, if it does close, does that give the body enough time to create collateral so the patient's not as symptomatic when, it, when it's closed? Yeah, or, or different channels? <laughs> that's a good question. You know, the patency of, of you know, I, it's hard to get a good judge of what the pain is because sometimes these patients are not compliant with their anticoagulation, so they thrombose off early. But I would say that Probably at about a couple of years, your patency should be close to 60 or 70 percent from what I've, mm -hmm. what I've seen. Then, you know, speaking to other colleagues who do a lot of deep venous stents for other reasons, they have relatively good patency. Now, if it does thrombose off, depending on when it thromboses off and how acutely it thromboses off, I mean, usually the body is able to, to adjust to some degree. You may see a lot of collaterals developing, you know, around the groin or leg or in the abdominal wall. Um, if I do catch it early enough, then yes, then I will try and intervene on it to, uh, to keep it open. But once you have a you know, thrombose stent, then, then your, your secondary pain C obviously will be, uh, will be lower once you start intervening on it, once it's already thrombosed. I mean, we shared that one patient where we stented it, and I think he did occlude, and he's, he's, he's still asymptomatic now. He's still asymptomatic. He's developed a good collateral network, and, uh, and he's essentially uh, asymptomatic from his leg, and, you know, that's the best uh, situation we can. Unfortunately, he was lost to follow-up for about a year. Yep. So, you know, it was too late to, to try and do something on him. Uh, but, 
the fact that he's asymptomatic and is doing okay, we've just decided to let him yep. uh, leave him alone. The, uh, the, uh, the now, now let's talk a little bit about May Turner syndrome. You know, uh, now when you talk about May Turner's, which seems to be the primary indication where people are doing this uh, in both the outpatient, not so much you and me here, yeah. but but more more in the outpatient. Um, you know, what what are, what are certain considerations technically? Uh, what how important is intravascular ultrasound in May Turner's? How how important is a uh, pre 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 op CAT scan? Uh, it may turn us, and and um, and how does that differ from what we're doing? I think most people will get preoperative imaging if they suspect may turn. I I always do either. I'll get an MR or a CT venogram uh, to get an idea if this really is may turn or not. If you decide that it is, it's important to have IVIS when you're when you're doing the procedure again to confirm the diagnosis and also to help you size your stent because uh, you can really see it very, very nice. nicely. You'll see yeah. the artery crossing superior to the to the vein on uh, on IVIS, so it'll help you confirm your diagnosis, give you an idea of what degree of stenosis you really have, and then appropriately size and, and uh, treat that area. Now, is, uh, have you experienced this type of thrombus associated with May Turner's? Or Absolutely. Uh, and how often does that occur versus just a compressive syndrome? Actually, I would say that that's probably more common than anything else. We have a lot of young, young women who come with iliofemoral DVTs mm -hmm. on the left side, uh, due to a, a May Turner. So anytime I see a young patient uh, with an iliofemoral DVT on the left, I mean, that's my number one diagnosis. And then, you know, you can you can work them up for any other m uh, rare things like malignancy or mass effect, et cetera. We have a few people who've had, you know, fibroids that are compressing yes. their uh, iliac vein, and that's also relatively common in the, in the, in the younger patients where they develop an extensive uh, DVT from the mass effects of, these, of, the, of the fibroids. So, so that'd be another uh, reason, you know, where they have compression. So the question then goes back to our initial workup that Dr. Dangus brought up. One is why not get a pelvic ultrasound? You said that it's not routine. When you talk about all these external structures that can possibly cause issues, what do you lose if in a person of age or in a person where you say, hey, you know, she's a woman, she has a uterus, she might have fibroids. What, what do you lose by getting that, uh, that pelvic ultrasound uh, while you work these people up along with your obviously thrombotic workup uh, or, uh, you know, anti anticoagulant shin workup? What, what, what do you think? Well, I think with a pelvic ultrasound, on, you're not going to be able to visualize the vein. Right. So that's the number one problem, right? That's why when we do a venous duplex, they may be able to see a little bit of the external iliac vein, but really beyond that, it's it's almost impossible, you know, to to see it. So that's why even even monitoring these stents with venous duplexes also gets a little bit tricky. I mean, you have to have a very good ultrasound technician. The patient, you know, can't be obese. Uh, it's very difficult. So even if you were to get an ultrasound and you see some fibroids or something, you really can't see the vein. So you don't know if that's really compressing it or not. So that's why CT venogram, although it has some radiation and dye will probably give you a much better answer. So then uh, having said that, when you monitor them, how often do you get a CT venogram? For, uh, for, you mean for follow-up? Follow -up I, don't, I don't get a CT venogram to follow the stents. We just try and do it with duplexes. Okay, so you if do try. Yeah, we okay. do try with duplex to get uh, a, a stent study. You know, we have very good ultrasound technicians who are relatively good. And once the stent is there, it's expanded, they have a, they have a landmark to go and try and look at. Uh, if the patient becomes symptomatic, then you know, then obviously you want to be a little bit more aggressive. Whether you do a venogram and take a look, or whether you send them for a CT venogram, most of us would just send them for a CT venogram at that point. If we notice that there's some symptoms that we can't pick up on the ultrasound, of the patient's too big, and we can't, you know, get a good visualization of the stent, uh, we would we would refer them for a CT venogram if they, if their leg swelling has. Uh, has recorded. So now, Dr. Malik, we're 22 minutes into uh, it now. Yep. Let me bring up a, a, an obvious interventional possibility here. Uh, because we see this balloon has a proximal and a distal balloon. Yep. If we take down, the, can we take down only the distal balloon and use a proximal balloon as a distal protection device and put alongside this technology uh, a rheolytic thrombectomy or some other thrombectomy so we can do more thrombectomy in addition to the TPA while we maintain the proximal occlusion uh, with this? Well, I think that you know, you'll have to have a very large sheath, first right. of all, but this yeah. is an 8 French sheath and it's tight to begin with, so you're almost looking at, you know... Well, we could put an 11 French sheath if yeah, we could do that. That would bigger. be a worthwhile... It, it, it would have to be uh, bigger because your, your trellis, I mean, your, uh, I'm sorry, your other device is, uh, you know, at least 6 French... Uh, <laughs> it's, six at French. it's at least 6 French for the, uh, for the realistic thrombectomy, yeah. and this needs, uh, I think, an 8 French eight sheath. French, so. so you're talking about a 14 or 16 French sheath to possibly fit both, and even then yeah. you probably and I don't could. think it'll make that much of a... Yeah, I don't think it... But, yeah. but, but, but I, I 
defense also would be significant. But I think, Dr. Dangus, I think that's a good point. If you want where, to use a regular where, balloon. Well, well, I think the point is, you know, it, whether whether we can do, uh, you know, adjunctive therapy along with this particular type right. of device if we're right. not, uh, you know, happy with the results. And I think that's what uh, Dr. Dangus I mean, Dangus that's what I'm saying. Say. Well, yeah. you know, I mean, during the electrophysiologic procedures, we put four, four sheaths in one vein. Right. So we could put a second sheath next to this one. Absolutely. And, no. um, and you know, I mean, access point, I don't see a problem. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that might be attractive if you've done that, if you resolve some clot and you still have uh, some left, maybe scatter around and all that, then, then you can still do the real, no. uh, rheolytic thrombectomy or something no. like that no. with, uh, with a distal protection. Yep, Dr. Degas, I want you to see this now, George. Uh, what now, we're doing, go ahead, want you to So start. what we're doing is now, you know, I've turned down the speed and we're starting to aspirate whatever mixture is within those two balloons. And you can see I've already started opening up the aspiration catheter. So we're gonna keep sucking out. Well, let me get a little four by four. Let's see what comes out of this. So, you know, you have to do this a few times. So this will try and remove all the thrombus and stuff that's within the, within the two balloons. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll release the proximal balloon too so that the blood starts flowing up and I'm able to aspirate a little bit uh, easier if I notice that there's not much of an aspiration. So let's see what kind of mixture we get inside here. So again, the holes this catheter has are how big? Uh, because that's a big clot. So it definitely is. You may yeah, not be able to, you know, it may be fragmented into sections that still may be bigger than the holes of the catheter. Yeah, I'm not sure as to how big the the holes are. Sometimes we will put in a, you know, an aspiration catheter to yeah. suck out more clot. I mean exactly. that. Uh, I mean these I mean, these are definitely not huge holes. And yeah. you know, we'll try and see if we see some any uh, thrombus burden or any, yeah. And if I don't know if you can take a look at this closely or we're not. We're uh, seeing some the other way towards your uh, your your uh, yeah, right side when you tilt yeah, it towards sure the right, way. please. Well, we're definitely getting some specks of thrombus here, George. But I I, I think that the the point here is not so much that we're probably going to be able to aspirate out the clot. I think we're just going to macerate it as much as we can, and and then hopefully mash it up against the wall with a balloon or a stand if we need to. Um, I mean, I mean, I, th I think that's part of uh, you know what you said about adjunctive therapy, which I yeah. think is a really great point. You know, we might have to drop the balloons here and go up with uh, with a realytic thrombectomy and and go ahead and uh, do adjunctive therapy. But as Dr. Malik said, it's going to increase the cost of the procedure, and especially if you end up using a stent and if you end up using a balloon. Uh, you know, what 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 are we doing here as far as the cost of the procedure? But again, everybody wants to do good patient care, and if that's what's necessary, that's what's that's necessary. necessary. So you know, I think at this stage we've we've finished off our our lytic therapy. I'm just going to step on floor for Dr. Malik. He's going to drop the proximal balloon, I believe. Or the, yeah. the, yep. He's dropping the proximal, the proximal balloon. So now what this is going to do is this is going to let the blood kind of start flowing towards my uh, catheter. This the balloon you mean? Well, balloon. it's actually, you know, it's actually, unfortunately, it's labeled, uh, the way it's labeled, it's proximal to you. So so this is the proximal balloon that and, we took yeah, down I understand, yep, on the uh, device. Uh, yeah, yeah so whatever. The lower balloon, the yes. balloon in the lower end of the screen. So, that the, so you can see yeah. where it's starting to get so more and more junk out of there as you can see I mean it's again not a tremendous amount but again it's very very impressive yeah. that you're able to pull this much out of this patient at this stage just a few more things as you saw our nursing team was very much on top of it in terms of talking to the patient how is she doing these these procedures do take an hour hour and a half sometimes or even longer if you need to do adjunctive work so you know I think that it's important to talk to the patient talk to her about how she's feeling we're watching her hemodynamics obviously we're a cardiac cath lab so we have her, her her blood pressure going we have her O2 sat we have uh, the EKG running so we're no, we're making sure that the hemodynamic parameters of the patient are still very very stable you know which is important because you know you're giving thrombolytics you're you're working inside a vein with a catheter that's mashing up a clot and obviously you want to make sure that all these things are you know forget about you know dotting these I's and crossing these T's so now you can see Dr. Malik has aggressively now dropped the distal balloon or the or the lower balloon as Dr. Dangus said and then uh, we're going to go ahead and just mash um, a little bit more, suck it out, and then take a picture whenever yeah. he think he deems it's uh, it's ready. And I'm just using the sinusoidal waveform to kind of get everything mashed up so it comes into my aspiration catheter, and then we'll take a picture in a few minutes, in a minute or so here, and see what it looks like.
So right now, you know, now, now, you know, Georgia, when you talked a little bit about the protection, I mean, that's what that was my logic in putting the filter in. You know, she's a young lady. We're going to we're going to manipulate this uh, this thrombus, uh, which obviously can migrate. God forbid. And even though the data may not support it, I think it's it's prudent in at least in my judgment for the for the safety of the patient. And I think that's why we did that. So, you know, and it's a retrievable filter, which we'll go back and get at a later date or today or boy or in this hospitalization. So she doesn't have to come back. And, uh, you know, and that, that's the reason why we did it. So here oh, now we're aspirating again from the distal port here. Yeah, I'm actually aspirating from the wire port just to get all the stuff out. If there's anything larger that's sitting there that will probably get through it, that should be enough, I think. I don't think we'll aspirate anymore. So we'll go and take now I'm going to go out. ahead and fluoro. We're, we're going to take down the proximal balloon now. And you have to be patient. Let the balloons come down slowly. Yeah, it takes a little while for these balloons to come down. So sometimes just let gravity help you. So you can see here, it's letting the balloon come down. Now, is there any risk if you if you pull the un, un, uninflated, uh, undeflated balloon <laughs> through the clot? Why it go? you don't inject with the balloon up? You're gonna have a higher resolution picture of your lesion, no? We could if you wanted to. Yeah, like right now, as the balloon is coming down, you yeah. can do a little injection. Yeah, you wanna do that? Okay, give me some dye, guys. I'll inject through the side port. I don't think you'll reach from there, because that's uh, no? gonna be tough, yeah. Okay, then you can inject through we here. We can inject through here, actually. Yep, we can inject through here, that's a good idea. Get us some contrast from the... Uh, we'll just have static... We'll probably have just have a more or less static column there, but... Well, we're, we're having brisk flow in the vein. I can see that. So maybe we did make a difference. We'll, we'll see this here. <coughs> uh, normally, I, I would probably say not to inject through this if there's some thrombus in the port or DSA? something like that. Yeah, just DSA. <coughs> so we were okay. able to aspirate very nicely. Right. So we're going to just inject... Yeah, yeah, we're see. all the way proximal. Yeah, because this is the wire port, unfortunately. We're not going to... Uh, oh, yeah, uh, you're injecting from the wire. Yeah, no, I may have to inject from the down. aspiration port. Okay, Let me try no, again. We'll inject for the sheath after we take it out. Yeah, I okay. think let's just go ahead and take this out. All right. Then. We'll take let's it out and take the sheath. Sheet. We'll get the wire in there, and then we get the balloon down for one second. Yeah, give me a little... We'll try a little bit through the sheet, see if it goes up slowly. Can I get an empty 10 cc syringe? Empty second? syringe, guys. Yeah, I got it. Thanks. We deflate this balloon. We'll just use that to suck it back and lock it. Yeah, I could. Mm -mm. It's going to be tough, yeah. It's going to be tough. Yeah, it's very tight. You can't really inject through this port. You could inject through the aspiration port because that has wires. Uh, that has stuff everywhere if you want. So, you so could I find, yeah, I find putting a catheter will give us a pretty nice picture here. So what so we did was we used a large syringe with the negative to really, like like, the, like Dr. Malik said, let the balloon come down. And you have to be patient. Yeah. We can see the Finally, air. the balloon came down. It takes a long time to go from like 100% to 80%, but yeah. like from uh, uh, once it reached the uh, 60 wire. 70%, wire, it came please. down very quickly. So now we're going to put a wire up um, into the IVC, and then uh, we're going to use a stiff wire. Um, obviously, to in case we do want to do any any stenting, uh, we may or may not use IVUS depending on what we see. So what we'll do is we'll just put this up for this for the time being. I'm just going to show Dr. Malik above. Yeah, you always want to be careful when you have a filter up there that you're not uh, getting stuck in it. So you see when I'm going past the filter, I'm just going to pull this down a little bit. Yep. There's always a little cap at the end of it. I'm just going to go a little slowly, okay, to make sure that we're yep. across now you're the across it. Just now hold the sheet over. Yes, okay. of course. Good. Carly, you got that? Yep. Yeah, it's, it's a little tight coming out through the sheet, so you may have to make sure that someone's holding the sheet because... Okay, now you're out. So now we might have to put a catheter up yeah, to eject. Yeah, it's kind of far. It's a long distance. So, so. let's get the... Uh, the um, we we'll use uh, here a coated uh, uh, catheter. Uh, it's a glide-coated catheter here, George. I think you can use any catheter you'd like to be able to inject. Uh, we, I mean, you can use a pigtail if you want, but we're just using an end hole catheter just to get a general idea of what's going on. And then this also gives us the advantage of if we need to change out for an intravascular ultrasound to take a peek, what we'll do is we'll quickly uh, go ahead and just change out the wire using this catheter. So now we're going to this level here, rail please. Okay, so I just wanna go ahead, take it up to about right about there, wire out please. And then I'm just gonna inject through this cap, which we're already on digital subtraction. Do we have so there should be no issues. What size? I no, guess you could that. also use one of these aspiration catheters uh, because uh, uh, you know you can inject from the aspiration portion. Well, as you can see, we didn't make much of a difference with all that work we did. Uh, you know, we still have a significant uh, clot yeah. there, or whatever it is, a structure yeah. that's obstructive. I don't know what that is. It may not be a clot. I, I definitely did something like a clot further proximally in the around 10 or 15. I don't know if that no, was that's, there that's or... Just, that's just mixing of unopacified blood so, uh, from the other side. So shall we just balloon this now? Yeah, I think we'll have to balloon it because it is, you know, and... And how are you going to size the balloon now? 
You know, we'll probably just use a 10. We just have to use a 10, uh, 10 millimeter balloon just to see how it kind of reacts to the ballooning. Give us and a 10, guys. 1030 should be fine. Definitely the cloth goes all yeah, the it's, way. Yeah, it's, it's, it's it a... Definitely, I'm saying the wire goes really smoothly. Yeah, but it's oh, definitely oh. A, a funny looking cloth even on cat scan. I mean, the location, the history. You know, maybe it's just a scarred down, you know, maybe it's a, it's it's older than what we think it is and it's just a scarred down area of the vein at this point. Maybe you want to cut someone out with the atherectomy. <laughs> 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 uh, what is that? Yeah, wait, what size is this? 10 by 20. 10 by 20. What length? 85 probably. 85 is fine. Should reach. It should be reach. Okay. Yeah. So obviously we're going by 10 by 20. We have our own 10 millimeter balloons if we're going to use 10. That's okay. It doesn't matter. Whatever balloon that we use, we use. Uh, obviously, watch the shaft length of what you're going to do. And uh, we used a 20 millimeter balloon here. Yeah, Dr. 20, Alex. 30 should be okay. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a two centimeter lesion. I probably would have used a little bit longer, but that's yeah. okay. Let's see how it works. Yeah, this is our first uh, level. Can you yeah. go scene minus here, guys? Show us the lesion. You know, luckily, it, luckily in the veins, you're okay when you uh, balloon Real. angioplasty, the Real. surrounding tissue. And the mm. arteries, you obviously want to avoid doing Show those. Show me so down much. below, guys. You're already up there. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay, good. Right there. It's fine. So you want to be at 20 or 30. Well, I'm going to go scene minus here. Scene minus. And save it on the other side, guys. It's there. Oh. Yep, it's at 30. Yeah, at 30. Okay. So. so let's uh, rail me, please. Right there. How's that? I think that's reasonable. Go a little higher. A little mag up, please. Because your, your end is at 30. Mm -hmm. So get your distal. Go a little bit more. Higher, higher. Right there. I'm liking it right there. Yep. How's that? Okay, it's better. Okay. So just go ahead and balloon that, and then let's see how, how it responds. And it's a vein. I mean, I don't expect it not to uh, open up nicely here. You expect it not to open up? I mean, I expect it to open up nicely. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> I was surprised when you said that. So, so we're going to go ahead and balloon this. One second. Let me check my position, make sure we didn't move. We didn't move. Go ahead. Well, well. Ah, I can see. I will see a little bit of a watermelon seeding yeah. over there. Yep. We'll see how I'm, that I'm goes. I'm going to go we forward we here. We've got to go forward, yeah. Yep, if, I'm gonna go maybe move. if you had a 30 millimeter balloon. Get a 30, three. a 40 millimeter balloon. Yeah, maybe a 40, oh. 40 so fine, you're yeah. well around it. There's no 16, there's no 16 stents, huh? There it is. It's a web. It's a web. Yep. Let's you see can how it looks, yeah. You see how it looks? Actually, we got it now. Just slowly go up, please. Yeah, just nice and slow. Give it time to adjust. And again, that's important too for the cardiologists out there who are already not doing um, enough vein work. You see, you have to give this balloon time to expand and not really go up rapidly. So you can see here how Dr. Malik said, just go slowly go up. And right now, you, we're just slowly allowing this balloon to expand. Now, is it a question of going to nominal or not nominal, Dr. Malik? You know, I think you have to make a judgment as to when you're that ballooning, that how much- have a lot of pain. How much it's, yeah, exactly how it feels, what she's complaining of. And I think that's probably okay, uh, Karthik. I wouldn't go any further if she's having pain. Yeah, then I'd probably just let it sit there for a couple minutes. So we haven't even gone up to nominal probably, right? Okay, so we're at nominal. Just give it a second or so. Let's just see how it looks. Well, remember, we had that one in the IVC that we could not expand the web, remember? Yeah. We're so well, we've had a few of these where, where you know, sometimes you have to accept an a, a, a adequate result rather than a perfect result. Absolutely. Yep. And I think that's just reasonable to think about it that way. Pain feels better? So again, right, why don't you come down? He, here's, the, here's the communication we're talking about where, where you know, the nurses are talking with the patient and the patient is reacting to it and it's very, very important. Cycle of guys, we also want to watch our blood pressure here, react to it like we would any time a patient has any pain in a, in a, in a visceral vessel that, uh, that we're going at an angioplasty. Okay? Right, let's take out. a little picture, yeah. Okay. So oh, you can probably take it through the balloon if you want. Yeah, pull the balloon back. And take a, just take a little picture, let's just make sure it looks yep. okay. Okay, now pull the wire back. Yep. Give me a little contrast, guys. So this is a, a poor man's uh, quick angio here. Yeah. Can we, can we get contrast in a bowl, please? So I don't have to do this every time. Thank you. So I'm just going to go ahead and um, and just inject inject pop. through the uh, the balloon port just to see what's going on. A little gentle injection. Oh, so, so it came back. So it's that. recoiled. So I think the decision has been made. What we need to do. Yep. Yeah. So you got to put it. You have to stand, but you so know, somehow <coughs> we'll finish it off before the. 
above the, uh, the the femoral head somehow if we can no be well, able to I think that's what we're that's what we're going to talk about now so two things uh, take home points can I have the wire please take home points one is balloon angioplasty respect the pain that the patient is having respect uh, the fact that you know if she becomes bradycardic or anything like that although unlikely in the venous system and if she becomes hypotensive worry about perforation obviously number two once you see this take a quick picture through the balloon the advantage of this is if is if you have perforated you have a balloon there to go occlude if you need to and and number three is now it also teaches you a lot about now that you know that larger ballooning is not going to help because two reasons one you know you've already caused pain and now you you want to go ahead and place a stent so question now as far as the stent size and where you're going to land the stent what are the landmarks we're looking at should better so you definitely want to look at the you know the femoral head or where the inguinal ligaments going to be but i would say that yeah. a lot of people who do venous disease would say that if you if you came down a little bit, it's probably still uh, worth it to go ahead and you know come right up yeah, to the come right up to the common femoral vein, and you know we're probably going to be really right at the at the femoral head. But at this point, uh, we do, we have to do that. I think you know leaving her like this uh, with her swelling, we'll probably get absolutely no no, no relief result, at yeah. this point. So. So, um, so we've got 18 millimeter uh, and 20 millimeter stents here, Dr. Dangus. So what I think we're going to do is we're going to decide on doing an 18 by 80. Uh, would that I don't be think reasonable? We, have an 18. Huh? we don't have an 18. We have 18. We do? We, can we have the 18 stent, please? 16. That's fine. Oh, 16, 16 is better. fine too. 16, yeah, 16 by 80, and we have 20 by 80 as well. 16 by 90. 80. Okay, give me the 20 by 80, please. 16, 16. Oh, 16. I'm sorry. 16 by 80, please. By 80, yeah? You don't have anything shorter? Or yeah, you know, shorter would be nice. And we want something that has a lot of radial force. So we definitely need a wall stent here, given that the balloon just, you know. You know, I, I got I to gotta tell you guys, you know, I, I don't necessarily agree with the shorter because I think with this amount of recoil, you're going to have to worry about watermelon seeding of this forward. Yeah. And I think that's where a little bit of where, you know, I guess, 16. you know, discrepancy among okay. all operators is going to come 16? open. Where's the 16 mil? Yeah, no, we got to upgrade the we'll upgrade yeah, and, and this particular stance also, you have to acknowledge that sometimes 16, if 90, they do 20, not realize 90, the 60, diameter okay. of 16, 16 yeah, then they're going to lengthen even Give more. Give me the temperance sheet. So it, it may become much longer than 80 in the That's end. True. And not like so the 19 old male stance that mm -hmm. will maintain be the, the length. If, if this uh, 16 millimeter stent is a, is a, uh, it accommodates the vessel of uh, maybe 12 or 14 or 11 or something like that, then it's going to be significantly more elongated. We're going to see about that. You know, uh, but I, I again, I, I, I go along the thinking of Dr. Malik here. I mean, my point is that uh, two things. One is it is going to extend across the common femoral. I don't think it's unreasonable. And I, and, and I think here, you know, as far as, you know, allowing this to be large enough to be able to cover the lesion, I think most commonly people are, um, at this stage are using longer stents in these type of lesions. So I'm just putting a, a larger sheet in rail, please. Putting a larger sheet in. Lo siento, senora. So putting a larger sheet in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yep. I think now we're done. Okay. No mas. So, so, so now, now we, we're putting a larger sheet in and now we're going to extend it. Now the other options, if you want to go with a 14 millimeter stent, yeah, we can the, use a different stent. The, that would be a self-expanding stent. The question is, you know, would that exert enough force to keep this all open? That would be, or over time would that... Expand know, and normalize. Yeah, I mean, generally we'd like to use a, we'd generally like to use a wall stent over here. I mean, it gives us a good amount of force, but... Okay, so, so we're going to go with the wall stent. I mean, we can decide. Again, I'm, I'm Let's actually... Let's put this up and see how it looks. And I'm uh, actually open to, to, uh, to discussion here. You know, if we have to uh, get another stent, we will, and we'll do it offline. But uh, this, this is the one that we chose. So we're going to put the wall stent up. Is she okay, guys? That's just some pain. Oh, this, okay, this at the, at the insertion yeah, site. Yeah, insertion site pain. So again, it's common to have the pain when we were going with large, large sheets She's been lying on her belly. So, Rail? Okay, we're going through. So, it's not passing. No there pass. it is, right there. It's too long. It's too long. Okay. Yep. Yep. This is definitely too long. So now, now the question is whether you want to just wait for and do it offline. Yeah, I think so. Let's try and uh, yeah, this is going to be way too long. So yep. we need to get the you know we need to go and find the right size. Uh, so, so better size, better fit. So what we'll do here is George, since we got a stent that's too long, 
what we're going to do is we're, we're, we're going to come offline and we'll show it in the next case, in the next live case, the final result. I think at this stage right now, you know, to reiterate, you know, what we've done, we've been able to, you know, obviously balloon angioplasty, we've demonstrated recoil of this, and then, and then we, we will go ahead now and, and place a stent. The, uh, the, fo the follow-up we discussed with, with Dr. Malik and with you guys, and for the sake of time, obviously, we're not going to wait because we're going to have to run all the way, um, you know, and find a stent, which we, it's not a common stent that we carry here in the, in the cath lab. And let's explain that why ones. the regular stents shorter. are... It's too long. Well, let's explain why a regular balloon expandable stent may be 10 by 40 uh, or might not be a good choice here. Let's uh, be very clear on our message to the viewers. Why would a regular stand 10 by 40 uh, might not be, or 12 by 40 might not be a good uh, choice here? You, you really want to oversize the stent as much as you can. I think using a you know 10 or 12 millimeter uh, stent in a 10 millimeter uh, iliac vein, a as things start expanding, you're, you do risk embolization of the stent. We've had stents going to the heart before just because they have been uh, undersized and you know, you've had to have open heart surgery to get those stents out. So we are very aggressive about oversizing. So most people, the minimum they'll put is a 14, 16 to begin with, probably even a 16 millimeter stent to begin with so that that oversizing is enough to keep it in place and it doesn't move. Well, we do have 14 millimeter stents. We have 14 40s, 14 60s. You know, 16, should we do a 14 here? Uh, so we, so this is just a self-expanding stent. So the question is, is it going to be enough force to keep this uh, keep this open, or is it going to recoil on us immediately, and then uh, mm -hmm. and then you know, and then we'll be have to place another stent through there to keep it open. Right. Uh, so let's see if we can find the the well, stent we need. So so what we're going to do here, uh, Dr. Nanga, So we're going to we're going to sign off let's to the audience. Let's go to a further. Let me ask a further question also. How about the stent graft? You know, a stent graft has been used as a bailout option. So let's say if we rupture something, uh, yes, you can use a limb uh, if you wanted to. I don't think it's generally routine that people put stent grafts no, not uh, for this. in the in the venous system. But we've had instances where the cava has torn, and we've had to place a stent graft. Now I don't think people are doing it, so it's tough to say whether there's any data out there to to show that the stent graft is any better than a self-expanding stent. So you know that's uh, something we'll probably see later on, but. At this point, it's, I don't think uh, anyone's doing it really for a primary stenting. I, I also think that the cost would be prohibitive of but when you could do it with a, a stent such as a uh, self-expanding stent or a wall stent. I don't think you need to worry about putting a stent graft in for these cases other than bailouts. Yeah. All so, right, great. So we addressed all these questions from the from the viewers and the audience. That was great. I think we made a lot of teaching points. Uh, so and we're going to show the result, uh, the final result in the next, next webcast, webcast since we are already about 25 minutes over over our scheduled time. Right, so just uh, just a conclusion, George, that to everyone that Dr. Malik will be giving a quick lecture, please come back and see that. And uh, also we'll do a quick recap of this uh, after this outside, uh, you know, and then that'll also be in the webcast going over the important salient points. But again, I thank uh, Dr. Dangus, I thank Dr. Malik for his time. I thank our team and uh, we'll go ahead and get this done and we'll share this with you. I'm disappointed that we cannot show the final result, but obviously equipment issues can't have everything on the shelf and Absolutely. sometimes you're gonna have to wait a little bit to get it done and I think we, we talked about the points. Thank you Dr. Dangus, thank you everyone for watching. All right, great. Thanks uh, for the interventional team in the, from the cath lab today. Uh, I think that was a very intriguing case, very unusual case. Turns out it was more of a web than a, than a free clot, probably a little bit of both. Organized clot in addition to a web. Uh, very interesting. We're going to have the final result later in the webcast. More of a reason to remind you that you can watch the continuation and conclusion of this case as well as the entire case from the beginning using the archived feature of this website. And I want to uh, remind you of three things. Number one, right after conclusion of this transmission, Dr. Malik is going to give live a talk uh, on this subject. The second, and on October 12th, here at Mount Sinai, we're going to have a, 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 a course on the top 10 advances in cardiology uh, this year. Uh, it's a one-day course at the Stern Auditorium of Mount Sinai here on premises of the medical school, of the Icon School of Medicine, I should say. Um, and, uh, and finally, the next webcast of this format on endovascular in, uh, under the auspices of Mount Sinai Heart and the American College of Cardiology is going to be at this website and CardioSource uh, on Wednesday, October 23rd, on the same time, which is the uh, 8 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. 
Uh, we'll see you. We'll see you then.